So here on the channel, I do a bit of heat treating from time to time, mainly cutting tools, pins, and making the odd tool a bit more durable. I mean, I do do a bit of heat treating at home, but I guess that is a little bit different. Now for what it's worth, heat treating can be as basic or as complicated as you want to make it. I mean, it can be as simple as just heating up a piece of steel to red, dunking it in water, and then tempering it to a straw colour. On the other hand though, you can make it as complicated as you want to, if you need a specific result or microstructure. And really, the sky's the limit when you get into the theory behind it. And because at heart, it can be such a complex topic, I think there's a lot of misconception around this topic. Ones that I hear quite a lot in the comments, which I'd like to address in this video. So, misconception number one. Quenching in water is a bad thing. You should always quench in oil if you want good results. I hear this misconception all the time, and put it simply, water is absolutely a valid medium for quenching steel. I use water all the time, and I get good results from using it. I mean, how else am I supposed to warm up the water for my tea? In all seriousness though, heat treating, or at least quenching anyway, is just a way of controlling how quickly a piece of steel cools from a red hot temperature. Water is probably the fastest quenching medium out of them all, and it cools steel about three times as fast as oil. And the truth is, some steels, such as W1 Jewel Rod, need to be quenched in water to obtain their maximum hardness. And the same thing goes for your plain high carbon steel, or maybe your case hardened steel. Water is the medium that you use, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now you can use oil to quench if you want, but you just won't get the same level of hardness because of the slower cooling rate. And the reason for that is that they're a low hardenability steel, which means you need to cool them fast to get the high hardness. Of course though on the flip side, you don't always need the maximum hardness from a metal, so using oil in these situations is perfectly valid. Plus they also do make steels that are designed for oil hardening, so you're able to get that high degree of hardness from oil quenching. For example, this is an O1 tool steel which I use quite often. It's oil hardening, it works great, and you can get at least 65 rock pill C hardness from quenching it in oil. Of course though, the biggest advantage to oil hardening is that it's less susceptible to the part warping or cracking as you quench it. Because water cools it so quickly, it's a particularly violent event, and yes, the part can very easily crack. For example, this was a part that I quenched in water, and it was not cooled evenly, and as a result, it warped. And this was way out of tolerance. As a result, I had to grind it flat, and that was a very slow process. If I was going to do that again, I'd probably use oil. And the problem is, is that as parts get more and more complex, and the more pockets and overhangs and places for steam to get trapped and unevenly cool the part, the more you want to cool the part slowly in oil, or even better, cool it in air. Obviously though, using the right alloys. Obviously I don't know for sure, but I suspect that if I quenched this part in water, rather than the oil, it probably would have cracked all the way down that centre channel. It's a pretty unbalanced part, and the alloy does call for oil. Even still, I still use water for about 90% of my parts, mostly because the parts that I use are carbon steel, and that's pretty forgiving. My parts are generally quite geometrically basic, and finally, water quenching is just easier. Put it simply, you fill up a bucket with water, sometimes I'll add salt to reduce the steam that can cling to the steel, I'll quench the part, and then I can empty the bucket, which is pretty straightforward. With oil, it is a much more intensive project. For one, I only have about 8 litres of oil to work with. I don't generally want to fuss around with anything more than that, although I could if I wanted to. You then have to watch the oil temperature, otherwise it can catch on fire if you're doing multiple parts. The parts then come out covered in oil, and also polymerised oil which sticks to them. They then need to be cleaned in lying, which is not a whole lot of fun. The oil then has to be drained back into the containers, and the container that I was quenching it in also has to be washed down. I mean overall, it is a pretty dragged out process, which is why I don't use it all that often. Even still, I can admit that it is probably the better process to use, but I personally don't use it unless I really need to use it. So pretty much to sum it up, they're both perfectly valid ways of quenching steel, there's advantages to both sides, and really I just look at it on a case by case basis. Misconception number two, just buy soft high speed steel and then harden it. I always get asked why I use O1 or W1 tool steel to make my tools from, rather than buying soft high speed steel blanks, or using broken drill bits, or hardening the shanks of broken end mills.
And I think it's fair, given that I have a lot of broken high speed steel end mills, and high speed steel is a lot more heat resistant than O1 tool steel. O1 starts to lose its temper at about 140 degrees, which is not very high. High speed steel is good up to about 3 or 400 degrees. And the simple answer is, high speed steel doesn't heat treat the same or as easily as a normal high carbon steel. To begin with, you need to heat it up to a much higher temperature, roughly 1200 degrees, which is about 500 more than you would a normal carbon steel. Plus, it also requires a pretty specific tempering process, which would be pretty difficult to do in a home workshop. I tried to replicate it myself, and you just don't get the same toughness and hardness that you would in a normal end mill. That's pretty much why I stick to the easier tool steels, such as W1 or O1. They're much easier to heat treat, and they still produce very usable tools. And any high speed steel that I buy comes in the form of blanks, which I grind into shape. They're already hardened, and the grinding process won't affect the hardness. Misconception number three, parts need to be tempered, or at least tempered to a straw color. And by that I mean using the oxide color as a guide to show the temper temperature. Taking the part to a straw color means that the part is taken or at least tempered to about 240 degrees and a lot of guides will tell you that that is a good point to aim for. What it does is it relieves some of the stress in the steel, it makes it tougher and it also doesn't soften the part too much. Overall it is a really good point to aim for for a basic heat treat. However not all steels need this and it's also very important to research your specific alloy that you're working with and also know what you want from your specific heat treat. One example could be case hardened parts. They're going to have a very thin outer shell of hardened steel and then they're going to have an unhardened but very tough core. Generally with a case hardened part, I only temper it to about 150 degrees Celsius and sometimes I just leave them as is, depending on how thin the case is. With a through hardened part, you wouldn't want to do this because it would make it way too brittle but with a case hardened part with that soft tough core, doing that is okay. Another example is going to be with alloy steels, because temper temperature can be really important with getting the properties that you want. For example, here is the toughness versus temperature graph for a W1A steel. You can see that it peaks rapidly just below 200 degrees Celsius. When heat treating this, we have a very small window to get the temperature right, otherwise we aren't going to get all that toughness. And it's also important to note that this graph isn't going to be the same for other alloys of steel. In a similar vein, hardness can also act like this. The hardness of plain carbon steel can drop off almost proportionally compared to temperature, but with something such as D2 steel, it can rise if you keep raising the temperature past a certain point. At least to a certain point anyway. All this is to say is that with the tempering process, tempering is just more than heating up the steel to a straw color. Misconception number four, harder is better, or at least better quality. You know, this is more of a knife community sort of thing, but hardness does not always correlate to quality. Now, a while back, I took a piece of hardware store steel, which was pretty much the cheapest dirt cheap sort of steel that I could find, and I simply raised the carbon content, quenched it in oil, and the result was easily 60 Rockwell C hardness. And that could have easily been 65 if I would quenched it in water. Hardness is simply a factor of the steel's composition and how it's heat treated. And I think the best example that I can point to is this drill bit. It's an Australian made Sutton's drill and it's made from M2 high speed steel. And it is a pretty good piece of kit. And what I have here are my hardness testing files. They go from Rockwell C40 to 65. And what they're able to show is that at the cutting end of the drill bit, not even the Rockwell C65 file can bite in. It just slides off which shows that the flutes of the drill bits are at least 65 Rockwell C in hardness. However, at the chucking end, it's been left soft. It's the same piece of high speed steel, but it's been left to less than 40 Rockwell C hardness. It's the exact same piece of good high quality high speed steel, but at each end, we have two very different hardnesses. And that's all down to how it's been heat treated. It has nothing to do with the quality of the steel. And in the same vein, what I have here is a very cheap Chinese high speed steel drill bit. The quality of the steel is definitely not as good, it's not M2 high speed steel, but if we look at it purely from a hardness perspective, the cutting end is the same, it's 65 plus Rockwell C hardness, and the chucking end is less than 40. So from a hardness perspective, they are pretty much exactly the same.
But I know, having used both of these drills, is that the Sartans is a better drill bit. It has much better hot working properties and it lasts longer. However, the hardnesses would not tell us that. All this is to say is that hardness is not always a good indicator when we're looking for material quality. And I guess to complement that, misconception number five, hardness equals wear resistance. Because in reality, it does not. Now look, here's the thing. Generally, when we're speaking about steels, harder steels tend to be more wear resistant than softer ones. Steel that has been hardened is gonna be more wear resistant than it was before. However, Rockwell C hardness does not necessarily tell us a lot about wear resistance. The metal's underlying microstructure and its composition is also going to be very important in determining that. As a quick example, what I have here are three very different alloys of steel. I have 1045 medium carbon, O1 tool steel, and M2 high speed steel. And let's just say we made a cutting tool from all of them. Through heat treating, we've got to have all of them be the same hardness say Rockwell 60. However, through use, we would see them last very different amounts of time before they become dull. And that's down to all of them being very different types of steel. And the same thing really does apply to knives. Hardness is one thing that is important, but the alloy that is used is also very important as well. Misconception number six, just because it can harden, doesn't mean you can harden it. I know it is a bit similar to number two, but it is one that I fell for in my early days of having this workshop. And that's really trying to heat treat unknown alloys of steel and being disappointed when I got pretty bad results. Case in point, this is a piece of chromonadium steel. It's a cold working steel and in some applications, it is pretty useful to have a steel like this. Now I know roughly the process for hardening chromonadium steel, but I didn't really know the exact alloy that I was working with. I didn't know the exact soaking times and temperatures for this specific alloy and as a result I never got the exact sort of hardness and toughness that I wanted when it came to heat treating the final tool. And look for some steels, mainly carbon steels, it doesn't matter what temperature you heat it to as long as you heat it up to you know a high enough temperature but with some alloy steels it really does matter what temperature and how long you hold it there. Misconception number seven, you need to harden everything. I recently made this bump centering tool for the lathe and one question that I got was, well, why didn't I harden it? And look, I've gotten many questions like that for a lot of other tools and I think the big reason for that is because A, I think people think hardening it is a good thing and B, I don't generally harden a lot of my tools. And there are a few reasons for it. Number one being, well, most steel that's available and most steel in my workshop doesn't harden. Most steel that you'll encounter is going to be a mild steel, and in mild steel there's not going to be enough carbon in it to quench harden it. And in general, I try to avoid high carbon steel because it's harder to machine, it's harder to weld, and it is a lot harder on my tools. Outside of that though, the biggest reason is most things just don't need to be hardened. Unless they need specific wear resistance, or they're going to be used as a cutting tool, or they're going to be under a lot of pressure which might cause them to gall. Generally, I'm going to avoid heat treating them. And the reason for it is, it is just a general hassle to heat treat stuff. And if it doesn't need it, it doesn't need it. It really is a fair undertaking to heat treat a part. And if it warps during the heat treating process and it kicks it out of tolerance, I then need to set up a grinding system and then grind it back into spec. Now, obviously, if you have a surface grinder, that might be a lot easier than it is for me, but I don't. So grinding it can be a pretty labor intensive process. And of course, what we know, the part could crack during heat treatment, and when that happens, it's pretty much back to square one. Misconception number eight. Harder steels are gonna be stiffer. Another misconception that I thought when I was younger, but as it turns out, no. A hardened high carbon steel is gonna be just as rigid or just as stiff as an unhardened piece of mild steel. So effectively what that means is that if I have two lengths of wire that are equal diameter, these aren't, but it's close enough. If I put them in the vise and then I apply the exact same amount of force on both, they should flex an equal amount of distance. What is gonna change though is how far we can push it. Right now, it's bringing back into place. That's elastic deformation. But if I push it too far, it's gonna become permanently deformed. With our hardened steel though, that limit where it permanently deforms is gonna be a lot further. 
It's going to take a lot more force to push it before it permanently deforms, and that's a result of the high carbon content and the heat treating process. With all that said though, the stiffness or the rigidity remains unchanged. Misconception number 9. Just heat the steel to red before you quench it. Again, this is more of an exotic alloy steel sort of thing, but even with our basic D2 steel, which is a very common tool steel, this is going to apply to. So effectively what I mean by this is that when we heat treat normal carbon steel, all we have to do is heat treat it to about 730 degrees Celsius, keep it there for about a minute just so the part heats all the way through, and in doing so you'll get the internal microstructure ready for quenching. However, once you start to work with alloy or tool steels, you need to heat it to a much higher temperature and for a lot longer before you quench it. If you don't do that, it's not going to harden properly once you quench it, and the end product isn't going to be as hard as it should be. As an example, when you're dealing with W1 steel, you only need to heat it to about 800 degrees Celsius for about a minute before you quench it. However, with D2 steel, you need to heat it to about 1000 degrees Celsius and then hold it there for about 15 minutes in order to dissolve all those alloying constituents before you can quench it. So if your results when heat treating these alloy steels isn't as stellar as they should be, just try switching up the soaking times and you might get much better results. And misconception number 10, used motor oil will harden mild steel. I've had a few people reach out to me and tell me to try out this method. Apparently there's something about the high carbon content in used motor oil that will help diffuse into the steel and raise the hardness. And having tried that method a few times, it practically had no effect. And the truth is, I really wasn't too surprised. The fact is, steel requires prolonged time, I'm talking about hours and hours, in a high carbon rich environment for the carbon to diffuse into the steel. It needs at least 730 degrees Celsius for this to work. And unfortunately, the hot oil, it just cools it down. And it cools down way too fast for any diffusion to happen. It just simply doesn't work. And that's why when I'm case hardening parts, I have to leave it in the furnace for hours on end. And that's about it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this one and I hope you did learn something new about heat treating. I hope the video wasn't too long winded, but heat treating is something that I was definitely very passionate about when I was learning it, and I hope you enjoyed something in this video. So take care, and I'll see you in the next video.